this. Super. So without further ado, everybody welcome to a webinar that is a collaboration between ESP and the GEC. Uh, a little bit about the global energy community that I am also a part of and will be today's host. My name is Irena Gorianz. And this is a global engineering community, global energy community. So what do we, uh, what, what are we, just in short? Uh, we're a group of energy enthusiasts, volunteers. We dedicate our time uh, for these projects that we do uh, without any compensations, but in the hope of building a global energy community for all of us, including the, the enthusiasts from all around the world. Our vision is to be the biggest decentralized energy community in the globe. And the mission is to unite independent global citizens around the goals of affordable and clean energy. So in short, what do we do? We gather experts, we have a network of experts, we try to connect the, them with each other and uh, between our attendees, our guests, and ourselves. We host webinars, we record podcasts, uh, we post global energy news, anything that is extremely interested for, uh, interesting for us or for our viewers. We collect knowledge and share that knowledge with uh, anyone that is willing to listen and co collaborate. And also we post memes. These are some examples of our posts that you can find on um, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Yeah, pretty much anywhere, but we're, we're still grasping on the TikTok idea. Yeah, may, maybe in the future. There are a few cooperations that we actually do as online and our offline pre presence. So Illuminum is one of our first cooperation. It is a world re leading, leading resource of trending high quality information for energy sustainability, policy, climate change, and more. So if you are interested, you can go and check out our website and just simply Google Illuminum for more information. Also, we were a part of the Energy Youth Day uh, as a part of International Gas Forum uh, for more than one year, since this is actually a place where we all kind of got inter interconnected from all parts of the world and got the idea of actually starting a community where we can share our knowledge and everything that we gather upon our, our ways. And the latest, it's Leipzig University in Germany, where one of our amazing co-workers actually uh, did her uh, thesis and did a session about the global energy community and the role of youth in the global cooperation. Uh, and we have also worked with uh, NIA, the new energy advancement hub, uh, you can connect to them over LinkedIn or Instagram and learn a lot from, from this, this company. We are hoping to have even more productive and interesting projects with them in the future and this year. And the Energy System Sustainability Program, of course, that helped today's webinar come to life. This is a little introduction for all of our other team members.
we had a really, really cool music on this video. So sorry that you couldn't hear it, but you can find find us on YouTube and listen to it as well. So oh, thank you very much for your patience. You can use this link to go to our um, information tree and find us anywhere, almost anywhere on the internet. So the person that we are actually gathered here today to listen to is our Madliso Chimpeni. He is a climate tech innovator and energy entrepreneur. I'm very excited to let him get get on his way with the, our today's topic, and that is the significance of biofuels and e-cooking in the transition to clean cooking. So have a great time. Just. The floor is yours. Oh, okay. Um, let me just share my screen. I hope everybody can see me and hear me as well. We can hear you loud and clear. You can and see my screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. I don't know if it's good night or evening. I am Madison Penny. I am uh, a climate tech innovator and an entrepreneur. Uh, I am a co-founder of a company called Bebu Energy. We developed a helix type wind turbine in collaboration with an Argentine partner. And uh, we are actually deploying this technology in Malawi or wind microgrids and standalone installations. We're also looking to expand into uh, mini hydro grids utilizing the same technology. It's a multifunctional technology that can be um, utilized for both hydro and wind energy. But uh, I'm not here to talk about my enterprise. Um, I'm here to talk about the significance of biofuels um, and e-cooking in the transition to clean cooking. I've been working in the clean cooking sector for for about five years now. Uh, I've worked with different biofuels, uh, briquettes, biogas, ethanol. Um, I've researched bio LPG, bio CNG. Um, uh, I also ventured into the wind energy sector, like I said, but uh, for now I'm in the wind energy sector. Um, clean cooking is a, is a crucial issue that needs to be so that needs to be addressed in specifically developing countries so there's parts of asia there's africa and parts of south america as well so in in the majority of these uh countries we rely heavily on biomass fuels so like from this picture you can see uh, there's a woman that is cooking on a I think that's a three stone fire using firewood. So this is a common narrative in the majority uh, of the African countries. So there's about 2.5 billion people that use fossil and biomass fuels for cooking. And uh, that should be roughly about 600 to maybe 900 million people that are in Africa that are using fossil fuels and biomass fuels for cooking. So that is one of the major leading causes of carbon emissions. Um, Biomass burning stoves produce approximately 1 billion uh, tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So uh, this does not only cause in-house pollution, but it, it also exacerbates the effects of climate change, change by increasing the temperature of the globe, uh, in so doing, uh, accelerating uh, climate change. So Clean, clean cooking has been introduced in recent years to address this issue, to reduce the overconsumption of fossil fuels as well as biomass fuels in the cooking sector, uh, so as to reach net zero emissions uh, and fully transition to clean energy in basically all sectors. So what is clean cooking? So clean cooking is basically the use of energy efficient 
and low low zero emissions technologies and fuels for cooking. Uh, so we have existing solutions uh, for clean cooking that have been developed and are still being developed uh, up to date. We have e-cooking appliances, um, things like pressure cookers, things like induction stoves. I'm going to talk about those ones. Um, we have LPG or CNG, LPG, liquefied petroleum gas or CNG, which is uh, compressed natural gas. So they're both harvested from from the earth, I should say. But there's another, there's also another version of CNG that is bio CNG, and it's a form of purified biogas. So they call it bio CNG because it's, it has the same content as CNG, only that it's produced from biogas. So we have biofuels that include biogas itself, um, briquettes, ethanol, uh, bio CNG, bio LPG as well. Um, so there's also another uh, existing solution that is fuel efficient biomass stove. So like the one that's in the picture, it's called a Gikoko. That's something something I saw in Kenya. I think if you have any Kenyans here, they can uh, they can recognize it. That it's it's a brand that that was developed in Kenya. So we have those ones. In Malawi, we have something that we call Jidebe Zumbawala. It's been widely adopted. There's about 2,000, over 2,000 of them that were distributed uh, in the country. So that's a bit of progress. So I am going to mostly talk about biofuels and e-cooking because they hold the largest potential to to help us transition from, uh, from, from the use of biomass fuels to cleaner fuels in cooking. Um, in biofuels, we have uh, fuels like briquettes, uh, biogas, ethanol, and bio LPG. So I'm going to firstly talk about briquettes. Um, this is the first fuel that I worked with when I started uh, venturing into the energy sector. That was just after I graduated from college. I, I have a, a Bachelor of Science in Biotechnology. Um, it's, they're not 100% they're not related, but they're, they sort of do have elements that intertwine. So uh, after I graduated, I couldn't get a job. So I started uh, looking for things that I could do on my own and I went into the energy sector. So the easiest thing that I could start with was briquettes. So uh, like I said, briquettes are the easiest thing that anyone can do. You can do it at, uh, at a household level and cook with them. So they're a direct substitute to charcoal and firewood because they use the same um, mode for cooking. So you have, you have your own stove there that you use for charcoal. You can basically just substitute that for briquettes and you're going to cook properly but uh i do not consider briquettes as a as a working solution to energy transition in clean cooking i consider them as an intermediary solution because they are produced from biomass uh, waste things waste like um sawdust um what's this wood chips uh, agriculture residues but when you burn them, they also produce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But uh, there are some briquettes that have been improved in quality that do not produce any sort of smoke, but still they do produce a lot uh, a quality, uh, an amount of smoke that can still be harmful at, at, at a certain level. Um, there is also a process that's called decarbonization where you have a briquette like that, that's in my picture, that is a, um, that is a uh, uncarbonized briquette that's just basically made from raw sawdust or wood chips. So they, they burn that to remove all the carbon just so you can have a char, a bar of charcoal, so something like that. So um, in that process also, you really you release carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere, but, you, uh, it, but you're subsequently preventing the emissions of carbon dioxide in, in the household. So that's the advantage that those ones have. Mm, so briquettes have not really been adopted widely in households. And the biggest challenge with that is that briquettes um, might not are not as efficient as the most efficient charcoal that's on the market. It's because um, to 
to produce a very efficient briquette, you need machinery. You need machinery that can compress the briquette at a very high pressure so that it's intact, that when you, when you put it in, in your stove, it doesn't crumble when it burns. So a lot, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs that, are, that do briquettes with handmade machinery or hydraulic machines. And uh, that, is, that is a way to go since uh, most of them do not have the right equipment to produce the high quality briquette that's required to compete with charcoal. But it does not provide a direct solution or a direct competitor to charcoal because when you put the briquette on the, uh, on the stove, it cannot burn as efficiently as charcoal does. So <clears throat> the majority of, of households do not uh, prefer to use briquettes, they prefer to use charcoal. If you, if you give them briquettes and charcoal, eventually they're going to stop using the briquettes, they'll start using charcoal. So briquettes have been widely adopted in industries. So in industries, industries that use heating to process things. So in Malawi, we have a company that produces uh, chicken feed. So they use a lot of briquettes uh, to process their chicken feed and that works for them. But for households, it's a big challenge. So just to tell you what I'm talking about, I've done this before. I, I initiated something I called the Mpebu Initiative where I worked with a number of women, the women that you see on the right, uh, I trained them and we started making briquettes. We'd make briquettes and then fill, fill them in a box and sell them. So the, the largest challenge was that we were making the briquettes by hand. Um, they, they weren't compact enough. They didn't have enough quality to compete with charcoal. Yes, they did burn well, but they couldn't burn as well as charcoal. So my deduction was that to actually uh, have a briquette as something that can uh, catalyze a transition from biomass to cleaner fuels, you need to have, have an industrial approach with briquettes. You need to produce briquettes of a higher quality. So luckily enough, there's, um, there, there's a machine that can do that already with briquettes made from sawdust. So sawdust has a, a, natural, um, a natural ingredient that's called lignocellulose. So when you, when you compress that at a very high temperature, the lignocellulose is going to melt and stick to the sawdust material. And that, that creates a really good binding material that makes the quality of the briquette really good and it can compete with charcoal on the market. But the problem is that you need a lot of investment to get that machine and to get to produce that um, uh, on a mass production. Yeah, so briquettes do have a potential to, to uh, help the transition to cleaner cooking, but we need to have an industrial approach to have these things uh, roll out on the market, uh, distributed to households, uh, have them available uh, in, at distributor points, as well as uh, have them available for industries to use. Um, the next... Uh, fuel that I'm going to talk about is biogas. Um, biogas is basically an indirect substitute to biomass fuels because unlike charcoal, you, don't, you cannot use the same stoves. You need a whole different apparatus. You need a biogas stove, you need um, a biogas digester, you need a biogas, uh, in everything. You need ways to produce the biogas. Um, just give me a second. Uh, it's been uh, widely adopted for institutional use, especially in Malawi. Uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of households that have farms, no, not household, but people that have farms have installed biogas systems in the country. Even schools have biogas systems that have been installed in the country. Uh, even in places like the USA or even in Europe, they have really big anaerobic digestion plants that produce biogas and then they purify that to bio CNG and feed that into a gas grid or generate electricity with it. Uh, the largest, the biggest challenge with biogas for adoption uh, for domestic use is basically the availability of um, waste. So you need a lot of waste to produce biogas, uh, to, to produce biogas. So 
So with the average waste that a household can produce, it's not, it's nearly not enough. Okay, it's not enough to actually generate enough biogas for cooking because the household needs about one cubic meter of biogas um, to cook to cook with per day. And that's not enough. As you can see in the picture, that is a bio, that is a biogas backpack of one cubic meter. Um, I've worked with these before, I remember. Um, even these ones are not are nearly not enough for a household to cook with. And the problem is that they come with a low pressure, so you need a pump to constantly pump the gas to a, a stove so that it can work properly with at a good pressure. But um, Burgess does have does have a potential for domestic use. Um, and this is something that's called bio CNG. So when you purify your biogas to uh, 80 to 80 or 90 percent methane, you have a really good chance of having a fuel that is just as efficient as LPG and that can be compressed into cylinders or produced or piped into a gas grid to distribute into households. So this is a project that I, I worked on some years back, back in 2020. I collaborated with a few experts, uh, uh, some, in the some from the University of Surrey, some University of Portsmouth and another company, and um, another company called NGAS UK. They had developed that thing that's in the picture there. It's a biogas CNG plant. I think I talked about that one. You know, no, it's a purifier of biogas. It purifies biogas. It upgrades biogas to bio CNG. So the advantage of this technology is that it, it reduced the time, the steps to um, upgrade biogas uh, from four steps to one step. So that was the advantage of the technology that they created. We wanted to get this, to, we wanted to install this technology in Malawi, uh, mass produce biogas and then distribute channel it into pipelines, uh, like how they do with water. So basically that is the best way to approach biogas for for domestic for domestic use you need to uh, produce the biogas add value to it upgrade it and then distribute it directly to the households instead of asking them to generate the biogas on site uh, it that is a very flawed approach approach it, it it it's unsustainable it might not eventually work so what i'm talking about is something that's like that, uh, a portable domestic digester. That is something that I built sometime in 2020. As you can see, that's a drum. Um, that's the, it's a 200 liter drum and these are the tires and that's, there's the gas in there. I could make about 40 liters of gas per day, um, which was only enough to maybe cook some eggs and, and uh, maybe boil some, uh, some water for tea but it was not enough to um for cooking for an entire household um and and also the the, the waste the amount of waste that we were producing as a household was, was a household of about six people was really not enough to make one cubic meter uh, of gas so portable domestic biogas digesters are ideal to for supplementing um, other clean cooking fuels. Let's say you have electricity or you have um, you have LPG, so you can use this a portable domestic digester uh, to maybe cook something like uh, something else. Uh, you you have your main meal and then you're cooking something else. Uh, it's also an excellent solution to for managing household food waste. So instead of throwing it away, you can just put it in the digester and generate a little gas. Um, so that you can use it later. But uh, biogas is good for institutional use, but for domestic purposes, it, it's better that the biogas is purified to something like bio CNG that can be used for cooking in, in households if, or even in rural communities, you can put that in a cylinder and then uh, sell it to households where they can use it for cooking. So this is... Uh, an AD plant that's been installed in South Africa. Uh, I take that they generate electricity with it, but uh, this is just, uh, that just shows that uh, we have this technology in Malawi. We have these technologies, no, not Malawi, but we have these technologies in Africa. Uh, they're here and we can uh, learn from 
what South Africa did, because even in Kenya, they have something like an eight megawatt uh, biogas anaerobic plant that they, they, they use to generate electricity. I think in North Africa, they, they also have those ones. So um, it's something that, that was developed in Europe, but we have it in Africa and it's only, in, in, and it's only a matter of time that it could be scaled up uh to reach many parts of the of, of the continent we have so much bio waste that is just thrown out uh we could recycle that generate gas for cooking and also for electricity but mostly for cooking because um that would what that would serve a really um it, it would serve uh highly in terms of clean cooking and uh, transitioning to cleaner fuels um, so I'm going to talk about ethanol from here. Um, ethanol, uh, we all know what ethanol is. Uh, some of us drink it, uh, like it's Friday. So I'm pretty sure after this, I'm going to have some drinks. Um, but ethanol can also be used for cooking. Uh, in Africa, we have an estimated, uh, 450 billion liters that can be produced from crop residues alone. So that is a lot of ethanol that can be used for um, vehicular transportation, generating electricity as well, and cooking. Um, so I'm mostly going to highlight um, a company in Kenya. I had the privilege to uh, to see what they were doing with ethanol. It's a company that's called Coco Fuel. Uh, it's a very well established company. I don't know how they did it, but it's a prime example of uh, utilizing clean, clean, clean energy, or, I mean, clean fuels uh, for clean cooking. Um, they put a lot of investment in infrastructure uh, to have a proper distribution line. They have tanks uh, that distribute ethanol into dispensers. So these dispensers, when, when you get the dispenser at a shop, you can have a canister uh, like the one on the right. So you can get that canister and fill it at that thing they call it a cocoa point it's like an atm but it doesn't dispense money it dispenses ethanol the same ethanol that uh we use for uh hand sanitizers uh the same ethanol that we put in we put in our drinks uh you can actually get that with that from you can actually get it in the canister and then fill it into the burner to cook your food to cook your relish and anything else that you want to cook. So it's a prime example of when investment meets a really good business model um, uh, to push a, a clean fuel into the market. Um, I understand that the, the, the technologies are not actually developed within Africa. I think they're imported from India. Even, even the, the ethanol is imported from India, but, but, this is, but they establish a system that works really well. They have about a hundred thousand households that uh, are subscribed to their product. They use their product daily. Um, it's it's really amazing when I when I saw what they were doing and I was inspired. I mean if we could rec if we, if we could replicate that across the world in many countries that do not have fuels like this, that do not have uh, uh, that do not have access to fuels, clean fuels for cooking. I mean, we could revolutionize the cooking sector and uh, hasten the transition to cleaner fuels. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, specifically on ethanol. But, but we do have a lot of biomass. Uh, we do have, have a lot of crop residues in, in Africa. Uh, we just need the right investment and the right equipment to get this in rolling. Ethanol has the potential. I never thought that people could do this with ethanol, but here they are. They're doing it, they're distributing it like how you can distribute uh, LPG, how you can distribute um, <clears throat> um, how you can distribute CNG in, in cylinders, only that they have canisters for that. So I mean that's a, that's a, that's a good way to go. Uh, I was really excited when I saw that. So I, I also want to talk about bio LPG. So this is an emerging uh, fuel. It's an emerging fuel that is still in the piloting phase. So basically, bio LPG is a uh, synthetic gas 
a synthetic form of LPG that is produced from biogas, biodiesel waste of sink gas. So what they basically do is they split the uh, they split the chemicals apart and then they rearrange them to make uh, meth uh, propane or butane, which is basically LPG. So you have biogas, biogas, which is largely methane. So they use um, pyloresis to break the molecules apart and then rearrange them to to make propane and butane. Those that are chemists, I think they 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 pre pretty much understand what I'm talking about. So this is a sustainably sustainably sourced LPG that is not produced from petroleum, but it's produced from bio from uh, biomass. It's produced from biomass only that it convert it's it's converted and then scientists do their stuff and voila you have LPG the same LPG that you can get from um, gas stations. Uh, you have the LPG that's produced from biomass and you can use that just as well as LPG for cooking. Mm, I haven't really heard much about this technology up to date, but this is something that we were also looking at. We wanted to try uh, piloting um, bio LPG in Malawi. Unfortunately, we couldn't go forward with that, but uh, maybe in the next 10 or 20 years, or maybe five years, who knows, uh, somebody might pick this up and we might start a pilot for bio LPG. So e-cooking has been has been there for a number of years. Ever since the introduction of electricity, uh, we've had uh, elect electric stoves. We had we've had electric cookers. We've had microwaves, um, rice cookers. But uh, e-cooking is a is a new concept that utilizes energy efficient appliances, uh, something like pressure cookers, uh, the one that's in the picture right there. Uh, pressure cookers, induction stoves, uh, rice cookers as well. So these are energy efficient technologies that do not consume a lot of electricity uh, for cooking. Uh, and, they're, and they largely target urban and peri-urban peri households because that's where the electricity is. is. But, but, but also, um, I think, I think e-cooking is uh, going off grid as well, uh, targeting households that have solar home systems that can support uh, that can support electrical appliances like these. So uh, it's an emerging. Uh, there are emerging technologies that are uh, that I believe are catching on really fast. Um, as you can see, that's a a Telfor pressure cooker that those that's made in France. Actually, it's made in France. It's made in China, but the company that distributes it is the company that manufactures it is a French company they, they manufacture it in China uh, but it has custom-made names for African cuisine so I think that's Swahili and uh, that's basically Swahili so as you can see these things are already catching on uh, in Africa this is a sample that the company sent to me we're actually working together to get these things distributed in, in Malawi we're also working together to to develop an e-cookbook for Malawi so that they can have a guideline on how to use e uh, pressure cookers. So I think we also want to have our own language on uh, on the buttons instead of having Swahili. So so this um, e-cooking uh, has been introduced to also to also tackle the issue of biomass fuels of of the over dependence on biomass fuels charcoal and firewood, you see in many households, even urban households, um, they do have electricity, but they pre perceive electricity as something that's really expensive. So instead of using electricity for, for cooking something like cassava or beans or fish, any, any sort of food, they, they still turn to firewood and charcoal because they perceive that it's, it's, it's less costly uh, if you compare it to to cooking on electricity, but in the long run, charcoal is actually very expensive. Uh, it's actually getting more and more expensive now that um, the trees are getting scarce and now that forests are being protected. So charcoal is actually very expensive now. We had this uh, at home at my parents' household. I think they've had it for two years. They never used it until I went there and showed them that this thing is actually very efficient. If you're cooking cassava with this thing, um 
you're going to take about one hour if you're using charcoal, but if you're using um, a pressure cooker, it only takes about 15 to 15 to 20 minutes and you're done. You have your cassava. So these are just my, my trials, several trials that I was uh, doing um, on my own. Like I said, I'm working on an e-cookbook with group seb as well as uh, mix it's a an organization from from the uk so we're working together to develop an e-cookbook for malawi so these are what you call them um the bananas the fresh bananas i think it's it's a very common cuisine in africa in west africa as well as east africa they just get the fresh bananas cut them up and and cook them uh, it took me about 20 minutes to to finish cooking uh, the fresh bananas but if you're cooking on firewood and and charcoal it's going to take more than an hour so electric cooking has been introduced because it's more efficient uh it takes less less time uh it's less it's more cost effective if you compare it to biomass fuels so this is the cassava that I'm that, that I was talking about so that's the before and that's the after it only took about 20 minutes to get to get my cassava I don't know finished or done <laughs> yeah so um e-cooking has one of the largest potential to possibly substitute uh, firewood and charcoal in households that have electricity uh apart from that we have things like induction induction stoves um uh, and electric fires so if you basically have these things in your household, you wouldn't find any reason to use charcoal and uh, firewood for cooking because these things are actually uh, more convenient and they will cost you less in the long run. Uh, you might incur a, a high cost when purchasing them, but, but in the long run, they're going to save you on the energy expenditure as well as the time that you spend cooking. I think this is, this is actually... Um, very advantageous and for and for and advantageous for women uh, who spend a lot of time cooking uh, with firewood and charcoal. Um, if these technologies are introduced in the households, they would take little time to cook, hence they'll have a lot of time to do other things, businesses, um, anything that uh, can improve their livelihood. Um, I mean, people might say that uh, it these things are expensive in a way because uh, the one that I got uh, from, from France should cost about $70. So in my country, that is a lot of money. Uh, but uh, there have been incentives, something like, uh, I don't know if you know about pay as you go, pay as you go, you can employ pay as you go to pay for these things in installments where you get to use the thing and then paying little by little. Because I was also talking to another uh, another company that's called is it, um, I've just for A Tech. They have an induction stove that has IoT embedded within it, so it's an IoT induction stove where you can where they insert a a chip or a SIM card, um, so you can use the induction stove if you haven't paid for for it in that for that month you're not going to use it it's just going to automate automatically switch off so in that way you're going to incur um less expenditure on the on the purchase uh whilst you using it so it's very affordable for even rural, rural communities can uh adopt these things i think it's it's worked with solar home systems um solar home systems has been introduced uh, in the past 10 years, and now they're being widely adopted in a lot of rural communities. Uh, they can afford the upfront cost, so they use a pay-as-you-go model where they pay little by little. If they haven't paid that month, uh, they get the electricity cut off. So you can, you can actually employ the same business model and distribute these things in urban, urban and rural communities as well. Uh, we actually... Um, submitted a bid for the modern clean mod, uh, modern cooking facility funding it's a funding by the Norwegian government it's a lot of money actually they're providing up to 2.5 million euros so 
as you can imagine, there's a lot of funding that's going into the clean, the clean cooking sector. Um, there is that push to transition to better and cleaner technologies for cooking. Um, so how can we advance clean cooking in, in Africa or in, uh, in less privileged areas where they do not have access to cleaner fuels? Um, the, the first thing is increasing access to clean cooking fuels, uh, clean cooking fuels and technologies as well. So like I said, um, pressure cookers are not a thing in Malawi. Uh, you won't find them anywhere uh, because people don't know what they are. They do not have access to pressure cookers. So the moment you have, you provide access to these technologies, people are going to gradually accept them and use them. So like, like I said, even biogas, uh, for you to for you to get to use biogas, you need to have a biogas digester in your household to generate to generate your own gas and use that. So instead of doing that, you can you can centralize production of biogas, and then distribute bottled biogas to the households, so so that you increase access to the to to the technologies and the fuels. The other thing is sensitization sensitization programs. Uh, like another instance, I said when I went when I went back to my parents' household, they had a pressure cooker that they, they hadn't used uh, until I came there and I told them that this thing this thing is actually more energy efficient. You can use it to you can use it to save up uh, energy as well as the time that you can take to to cook. So sensitization programs are really necessary, and also the e cookbooks. E cookbooks have been developed in Kenya, uh, in Nepal. Uh, in I think in Uganda, in Ghana, in Tanzania, in Zambia, they developed e cookbooks where it provides guidelines on how to use uh, electric stoves, induction stove, electric I mean pressure cookers and induction stoves, so that um, you have ease and you ease into the adoption. You don't have much trouble utilizing uh, the technologies. You know exactly what needs to be cooked at what temperature. Um, at what time? So things like that are things like those are really important uh, in advancing clean, clean cooking uh, across the continent and also the globe. Um, secondly, another thing is developing business models for scaling down, scaling down the cost of clean cooking. I talked about a pay as you go model where you can uh, have people pay uh, in installments until they finish the the full payment for the products. And also, I talked about Coco Fuels. Uh, they have they they developed a business model that for for ethanol that produces that sells ethanol at a very uh, affordable price. Uh, households have uh, actually not gradually, but uh, it didn't really take time for them to adopt to the uh, fuel because one they had access to the fuel in the in their own communities they could just go to a dispenser and then get the fuel and two the the cost of the fuel was reduced so those are one of the factors those are some factors that can uh, improve the advancement of clean cooking across the globe um, um, but I want to emphasize on this one last point producing fuels and clean cooking technologies in country um, I think that that provides more advantage if you have the technologies produced within the country. So if you have all these clean fuels um, being produced within your country, imagine having uh, bio CNG being produced within your country. You have ethanol that you can uh, that you can produce within your country. All the technologies that support clean cooking, uh, all these electric pressure cookers. Um, uh, all these induction stoves, having the capacity to build these things, uh, these technologies yourselves, yourselves uh, in your own country um, is a great advantage to advance clean cooking because now you um, you don't have to incur importation or uh, custom cost uh, for the products. You have them within your country. The only thing that you have to pay is value added tax. And we wanted to set an assembly plant for electric pressure cookers in in Malawi. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the the companies that we work we work with say it couldn't work because something about um, the 
the cost of production is increased if you if you move to another country, which means they have to export some of the products. They have you have to import some of the products from where they manufactured. So it, it, it's it's just a matter of having all those industries well developed that you can source all the raw materials from within the country without having to import anything at all. Um, so about the opportunities that are in clean cooking, uh, the opportunities that are available for young people or any, or any energy professional that wants to um, push clean cooking for energy transition. Uh, we have a growing market for clean cooking solutions. There are a lot of sensitization programs that are going around uh, for people to transition. So people know that they're clean up there. We have, they have better options for cooking out there, but where are they going to find these, all these, uh, these technologies and these fuels? It's up to us to distribute these things, produce these things, generate them, manufacture, innovate, uh, and provide access uh, to this growing market um, for clean cooking solutions. We also have funding opportunities, uh, a lot of funding that's going into clean cooking. Like I said, uh, the MCFA funding opportunity, uh, they're providing up to 2.5 um, million euros uh, per company. So if at any enterprise, if you well established and you have your financials properly, you have a good track, uh, a good traction. They can give you that funding to scale up your operations to either distribute LPG, uh, e cooking appliances, or maybe you set up a plant to generate your own biogas, um, anything else that has to do with clean cooking. There are also job opportunities in the uh, clean cooking sector. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to talk about Kenya a lot because uh, it's like it's like Wakanda. <laughs> it's like Wakanda <laughs> for, for clean cooking because they have it all going on, honestly. They have non-governmental organizations. They have companies that are well that are well established that are developing technologies left and right. You know, I went there for the Youth Energy Summit or the African Energy Forum and also went there for the youth um uh for the africa climate summit and I'll, and i'd find all these young people that are working in the energy sector hey what are you doing i'm an energy officer for something 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 i'm an energy liaison for something 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 i'm the energy business development officer for something 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 you know so it's a very vibrant um industry clean cooking is a very vibrant in this industry in kenya um it's well established they have the right structures that can push it forward. So I really love if a lot of uh, developing countries had this sort of uh, mindset, this sort of um, advancement going on as well, because uh, um, <clears throat> if you have all these sectors that are working together and young people that are working in the sector as well, um, it's going to ease the push to the advancement of cleaner fuels uh, on the continent and the rest of the world. Um, we also have readily available uh, proven technologies. I mentioned about bio CNG. I mentioned. I talked about uh, pressure cookers. You uh, you want to, to distribute these things? Go ahead. You you just have to talk to a supplier or talk to a manufacturer. Anybody that's interested in um, in electrical appliances or LPG, I have manufacturers and suppliers that are willing to find a market in 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 the African continent. You can. I think I'm, I'm just going to, to drop my my LinkedIn and you can talk to me. I can link you up with those manufacturers. Um, if there's a huge market and they know there's a market, they just need people that, that can provide that link. So we have readily available proven technologies. You want to distribute, do you want to make them yourselves? Um, you only have to see what they're doing and just, and just replicate within uh, your own countries. Uh, you have it within yourselves. I'm an innovator. I believe in self-sufficiency and uh, making things yourself, making things on your own. Uh, I build wind turbines. I work with an Argentine uh, partner and uh, we work together to improve the turbine. And this is something that we're prototyping now in my lab. Not, not prototyping, with that, but we're actually uh, building it to, a, to an end product in collaboration with a university in the country. So <clears throat> we have it within ourselves to innovate, 
to build these technologies. Uh, I made biogas in my backyard. I made briquettes. So imagine if you have, if I have all those technologies, if I have access to funding, if I have access to equipment, uh, there is a lot that I can do. There's a lot that you can do as well as an energy professional. Uh, I think this is all that I wanted to present. I think I'm at the very end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting to hear about so many innovations and opportunities actually that are in this sphere of clean cooking that sometimes we take for granted actually. The electric appliances that we that somebody may be using every day in their uh, homes are uh, sometimes not, not so, um, how do you say? um distributed as we might think uh so we will start with the questions from the chat first and then i see a hand that is going up from onikachi uh but just a second so the first question was what could be approximate capex for the machine that can produce high quality briquettes from sawdust Oh, uh, um, just an estimate. Uh, it should cost about mm, fifteen thousand dollars upwards. Uh, I, I think I think that should depend on the capacity as well. But uh, I've seen very small ones that are built in China that you can get for maybe uh, five thousand or seven thousand. But they they they're not for mass production, therefore very minimal production, but they do produce the same quality of briquette. Mm -hmm. So it would be more for like a household or a few households, the, the machine that you're talking about. The machine that I'm talking about is for industrial scale. So you're looking industrial. at a whole area, like a whole city, you can produce mm -hmm. enough briquette to feed the whole city, yes. Thank you. So the first one uh, of our guests that had their hand up is Onikachi. Um, you can turn on your microphone and ask the question. Okay, and um, thank you. And thank you so much, Mr. Delitzo. Um, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, so I would say that clean cooking is an aspect of the whole energy sector that I'm most interested in. I find it quite fascinating. And um, my question is in two perspectives. The first is gender, perhaps gender inclusion. And then the second is behavioral change. So um, when you talk about clean cooking and introducing it into um, maybe a community or developing nation, you notice that women, women are the, like, they are the ones that use most energy for cooking. So when it comes to cooking, especially in developing nations, like women are the ones that always do the cooking. They are the, they are the ones that are always in the kitchen. They're the ones that are always getting the energy, maybe the firewood and the rest, especially in rural communities. So um, I also see during your, I saw during your presentation that you had, like you included women from rural com communities into like developing some of the briquettes, uh, which is a good, um, um, innovation, like is it is a good thing that you you're doing in in terms of empowering these women. But then I would I would like to ask, like when it comes to including women into um, policy making around clean cooking solution, like what is being done regarding it? Seeing that women are the ones that are actually um, they're actually um, affected by this whole issues around clean cooking. So when they use this traditional means of cooking, they're the, they are the ones that their health are affected. They inhale the smoke from the firewood and they understand how this traditional means of cooking affects their health. So how can women be include, included into policy making to further like make the clean cooking space more inclusive for them? And then when it comes to behavioral change, um, I would like to ask, um, how you could like encourage people, especially in rural community to adopt these clean cooking solutions 
seeing that most people in rural communities, especially in developing countries, they they um they are always they are already used to using basic means of cooking, that is the firewood. And if you if you're to go into these communities and then you try to enlighten them and educate them and try to transition them from using the um, fuels to cleaner means of cooking, they kind of run out it because this is what they would say that their ancestors have been using and nothing has happened to them or their environment. So how do you instill this behavioral change on this um people in rural communities and help them to understand that clean cooking solution is actually for their own betterment, for their um, good health and also um, a good environment. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, I can tell that you're very passionate about gender uh, and energy. Um, uh, policy, the policy issue is really hard for me to answer because uh, I'm not a, I'm not really a policy guy. I'm more of uh, into the technical stuff, but I, I'd really love to get into policy making. Um, it's something that I'm looking for. I'm I am looking to get into in the next coming years. But I think um, a lot of these technologies are are built so that they they favor women in some way. So um, for instance, electrical appliances, like I said, pressure cookers. So if you have a pressure cooker in your household, as a woman, um, the family is going to expect you to light a fire or if it's firewood to, to cook uh, anything, cassava or yams or, or anything that, that you can cook with a pressure cooker. But if you have a pressure cooker in the household, you have that that burden relieved off of you, or instead you're going to, to utilize the pressure cooker and, and only spend like uh, 10 to 20 minutes to cook it. All, all you have to do is prepare the cassava or yams and then put them in a pressure cooker uh, and it's done. So I, I don't know if there are any women that are um, having their say in the policies that are being made for clean cooking, but what I know is a lot of these clean cooking technologies favor women and in a way that they they give them they provide ease for cooking uh, as well as provide them with a lot of time to do a lot of things that they need to do to improve their livelihoods and also the issue of um, rural communities adopting to cleaner technologies it's a really it's it's a tough um, it's a tough thing to do to convince a somebody in the village to stop using firewood that they just go into the jungle, chop a tree and then cut it in bits and then they have their fire to start buying fuel. It, uh, that's really hard to do. That's one of, one of the biggest challenges I had with briquettes as well. You know, so we produced the briquettes, but then we couldn't do, go to rural communities and sell the briquettes to them because they had firewood in their house. They had firewood in their communities that they could just go to the jungle and get for free. So what you have to do is you have to provide technologies that are attractive. Uh, when they see these technologies, they say, uh -uh, no, you know what? This is too much time. I have to go into the forest to get firewood. I have to do this. I have to set up the fire. Why not just uh, use gas to cook with it? Why not just use a pressure cooker to cook with. So it's like what they did with solar home systems, you know? They they um, introduced solar home systems into households. People were using candles that were cheaper. People were using kerosene lamps that were cheaper. But when they saw that the solar home systems were actually better, they could charge their phones with it. Uh, they could light all, they could light the entire household with solar home systems. They started gradually adopting the solar home systems, and with the pay as you go um, payment model that was introduced, it it, was, it actually made it so much cheaper them for them because they could. Because in Malawi, you pay something like uh, one dollar, one dollar per month, one dollar per month for a solar home systems for something like for it for three years if it's not two years. So imagine somebody in rural communities, they only have to pay one dollar per month to have the solar, solar home system supply electricity to the household without having to buy it up front. They're going to pay for it little by little. So if you, in, so if you introduce those incentives uh, with clean cooking fuels as well, uh, 
you will see that a lot of rural communities are going to gradually transition because I don't think they enjoy fetching firewood or they enjoy spending a lot of hours lighting up, lighting up the fire. They don't, only that they don't have any other option. But if they did have a better option, they would, tran they would transition really quick. So I think that's all I can say about that. Thank you for your answer. And we had another raised hand from Natsante Taya Seth, but we are having a little bit of a problem connecting. For some reason, the guest was out of the chat, but I think we have, have them with us now. Yes, Natsante, if uh, you would as you would please you can turn on your microphone or write your question in the chat we're ready to hear from you or maybe just in a second if anybody else has any question, feel free to turn on your microphones, ask the question, or raise your arm. Uh, promise Ikpuri, please turn on your microphone. Yeah, good evening. Yes, hello. Can you, yeah, can you hear me? Good evening. Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think this uh, lecture was really insightful. I, I have uh, two couple of questions to ask. Uh, you know, I am calling from Nigeria. You understand the terrain of uh, the Nigerian economy. Uh, the economy is actually plagued with the issue of uh, low electricity. Um, we, there's actually no access to uh, electricity, particularly in the rural areas. So uh, my question is, how do we adapt or how adaptive or uh, is it for rural communities to actually transit from the traditional means of cooking to e-cooking uh, systems? Because the truth is that less than 2% of, uh, of uh, rural areas, they have uh, they have no access to electricity. So that is my first question. Secondly, um, talking about uh, the use of e-electricity systems or e-cooking systems, you mentioned something like uh, pressure cooking. Are uh, they health risk to using uh, pressure cooking, uh, particularly in cities where you have access to solar systems and um, a bit of electricity systems. Are they health risk? Because I am actually uh, looking at uh, uh, the economics of uh, the health risk of using e-cooking systems, electricity cooking systems. So are they health risk uh, with using this kind of systems? Thank you so much. Um, your first question, you talked about uh, access to electricity. Is that right? That rural communities do not have access to electricity. So Yes, yes, definitely. So e-cooking would be a challenge. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so e-cooking is, is, would be a major challenge in rural communities because of, of access to electricity. Uh, but uh, there have been trials to utilize e-cooking uh, from solar generated power using solar home systems so they can uh, power the electrical appliances for cooking. But I don't know where that, I don't know where that those trials led to. Um, but uh, e EPCs are generally not built for rural communities. They're meant for uh, urban interior, per urban communities uh, or just communities that have access to electricity uh, because those communities are the ones that actually consume charcoal at a really large scale. I think you actually agree with me that uh, rural communities don't actually cook mostly on charcoal, they use firewood. So it's the urban and the per, per urban areas 
that consume a lot of charcoal for cooking. So these it, these uh, electrical appliances cook, for cooking come in as a substitute for charcoal that is most consumed in in these urban areas in these peri urban areas. Uh, but uh, for my for for rural communities that have access to microgrids or mini grids, uh, it's uh, it's actually ideal to have EPCs distributed in the communities. So that works as well. Um, you also talked about health risks with uh, something like pressure cookers or any e-cooking appliances. So there are yeah. no health risks to e-cooking appliances. They just work as well as other electrical appliances out there. Mm, they just work, they work like cookers, they work like rice cookers, they work like uh, electric stoves, only that they're more efficient. Uh, they say they save a lot of time for cooking and they also save a lot of energy, uh, making them cost effective. Okay, all right. Uh, just to just to add to what you said in the first question, um, even in the urban areas and the peri in the urban areas, particularly in Nigeria, you find that the cost of electricity uh, outweighs. Uh, what we intend using it for. So for example, you find out that you spend money for fuel to power your homes, to, to power homes, to even use the e-cooking e e system. So moving, moving away from the rural areas, you will find out that you spend more uh, getting fuel to power electric, electrical appliances, even in the urban areas. So uh, I think th that could be cost effective and um, cost ineffective in terms of adopting e-cooking systems uh in the nigerian case so what do you think about that no i know you you're talking about uh electricity cutouts we have those as well in our in our country um we have those as well where, where we have access to you know uh, power lines but we don't have electricity because of blackouts and load shedding um that's a very huge issue um in malawi we don't usually use petroleum generators to have a backup source of electricity. If it's dark, it's dark. You're going to sleep with candles. That's how it, that's how it works. So <laughs> in your situation, um, yeah, EPCs would actually be very expensive if you're using them from a, an electricity backup that's coming from a petroleum generator. So the only way that it would work is um, if the actual electricity is back, use the APCs to cook on them. But then even if you're cooking with electricity using other electrical appliances, like a normal cooker, a normal electric stove, you're going to use more electricity if you compare it to using uh, e-cooking appliances like induction stoves and pressure cookers. So you're still going to save the energy and save time if you use the pressure cookers when you're cooking on a, a backup of petroleum generated electricity. Okay, all right. I think I think uh, it's better. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the question. We have Anya Pachi uh, with her hand up again. Okay. Um. Hi. Um. So you spoke about um a challenge that a challenge for the um, biomass manufacturing biomass. You said that we don't have enough waste. For manufacturing bio biofuels, sorry. For bi so, bio um, biofuels. Yes, biofuels. That we don't have enough waste. Yes, you said something regarding we not having enough waste to manufacture um, enough biofuels. No. During your presentation, or maybe okay. I'm mistaken. No, no. Go on with your question. So it's okay. Okay. So um, I'm. So you can see um, in my country, we have an issue with um, plastic waste. So um, we have these PET bottles that you can't easily recycle and then they end up being dumped into um, like maybe drainage systems and causing so many environmental issues. So um, my question is, is there a way, is there a technology an existing technology or uh, is there, are there people thinking about like producing a technology whereby they could like turn some of these waste could be 
e-waste or um, PET bottle waste, plastic waste into maybe um, foils that could be used for cooking? Is this something that is feasible? Yeah, it, it's something that people, it's a technology that's been developed because um, you know, plastic is made from petroleum based products, right? So they, there's a technology that can reverse engineer any sort of plastic, either if it's PET or um, high density polyethylene uh, to petrol and diesel, you can actually uh, re-engineer it to produce LPG for cooking. So there, there's already a technology for that and people are doing it. Just look it up, you'll you find that there are many examples on YouTube, um, anywhere on the internet, there, there are practical examples of that. Onyek, are you there? Yes, and um, thank you very much. Okay, maybe you you said there are there weren't enough waste from household to produce um, certain gas. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I okay, said. Okay, my apologies. Okay, I got yeah. that wrong. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, for everybody. There were some very interesting questions, and I will add to it uh, with something that was interesting for me and i'm actually interested in hearing your perspective on it what do you think would be the best policies or practices for marketing somehow at, at the clean cooking for the ruler, ruler rural areas and the maybe maybe older generations that have that kind of uh, that they're not keen on uh, using some of the new products and or new solution, solutions uh honestly the best way is is having uh, demonstrations uh, i think what cooking demonstrations in in rural communities uh i haven't seen any cooking demonstration that does a complete analysis of the advantages that you'd have when you when you're cooking with lpg or cooking with electrical appliances or biogas over um, biomass fuels like get your biomass fuel uh, cook something similar uh, on a different sample and get your lpg or e-cooking appliance and then and cook it uh, at the same time and then do a comparative analysis while people are watching i think that would actually uh, give people a better picture of the advantages that clean fuels have clean fuels and clean technologies have uh in in the cooking industry uh yeah i think that's the that's the biggest thing that you can do have cooking demonstrations and demonstrate that uh we have more efficient technologies yeah i heard it more than once from uh some of my even friends and uh, more older people than me uh i believe it when i see it so that's exactly. something exactly. we can adjust to this Thank you so much for your answers and your, for your presentation. Are there any more questions? One, two, three, sold. Uh, I hope everybody had a great time. Um, thank you for uh, all the things that we learned from you today. And that's it. See you in, in the next webinar and see you all of our guests also. Thank you for Have having me. Have a great day. Uh, thank you. Uh, Natsante, again, with the arm up, you have the last chance to ask your question if you do want to. Yeah, thank you so much, um, okay. Irina. My connection was very disturbing. I don't know why. So yeah. my questions are number one uh, regarding this biogas, like homemade, because uh, in Ethiopia, we, uh, you know, we implement this in rural areas, but they are not sustainable regarding sustainability because, uh, uh, you know, the skills to use the things and they also, you know, damage, I mean, harm the rural community while using. Um, so is there any means to uh, make it sustainable and 
to uh, you know to prevent from harm, har harming the rural people. One question. The other one related to those e-cooking, the induction um, stoves, and the other e-cooking um, stoves. Like I have a question. One is how much is uh, the energy? I mean, uh, power consumption or power demand of those things? Because since uh, Dal, I, I don't know how to, how to say his name, Dal. So said uh, they are efficient. So how efficient are they re related to those other types of uh, stoves? And also the induction furnace, I want to know like technical part, it, it, it's not like mentioned there. It only shows the minutes to cook some, some type of uh, food, but it doesn't show um, the, the efficiency and the wattage of those and also the frequency because it, it, if it is induction furnace i mean induction stuff we need to know like like uh, is it medium uh frequency induction furnace and what is the, the frequency of those thank you so much yeah, well, I realized that I should have logged out the moment you said that. Oh, let's close the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we still have one more question from another <laughs> participant. Those are some really tough technical questions that um, uh, I haven't really gone around because I just got into e-cooking this year. Uh, so I haven't really have had that much experience. But uh, from what I've read, uh, pressure cookers can have like a, can save you about can have about 90 percent uh, more energy savings than the other than biomass fuels uh, i'm not sure if compared to electrical appliances i don't know how much uh, how i don't know the difference in the energy efficiency they would have but um, one thing i can say is uh, if you compare a pressure cooker to a rice cooker the advantage of a pressure cooker is that when you close the pressure cooker um, it does not release any heat. So the pressure is kept inside. So the food is cooked at a really high pressure. So you only release the, the gas when you're done with cooking. So that's the difference with, with something like a rice cooker or something like, like cooking on, um, on, on, on an open fire because you're constantly releasing the heat into the atmosphere, losing heat in that process. So it makes it less efficient. But if you keep the heat inside the container that you're cooking your food in, you're going to um, conserve more energy, hence use less energy for cooking. So that's how it works. Uh, the induction stoves, uh, I haven't really got, gotten into the technical part of it. Um, but I can share with you a few um, documents that I have from MEX. They did several tests with induction stoves. Uh, also, other companies that are producing. There's a company called Real Flame. They also have induction stoves. I think they have documents on that. But so I can. Um, I think you you should just share my LinkedIn. Oh, uh, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but uh, yeah. So I could uh, you, you could share my LinkedIn and we could connect and I could share you more details on those ones. Um, yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, I can ask more of the technical questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we are we are actually out of time. So please, anyone that wanted to ask more questions, you can write them now in the chat, and we will answer those questions and po post it or send it to your emails so that everybody can have a look at the answers uh, from our expert. So that goes for uh, Mariam. I saw that you had your hand up, so feel free to write the question in the dialogue and we will definitely get back to you with all the answers as well as often that uh, write, wrote his uh, or her uh, question in the chat. And again, Thank you, everyone. This is definite. This is definitely the last question, and hope to see and hear you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.